Uh, we're going to hear, I think, uh, maybe some equally good report next uh, from a principal and assistant principal from Martin County, uh, Jan Wagner, who currently is principal at South Creek Middle School in Martin County, and Larry Hodgkins, who is the assistant principal at Riverside Middle School in Martin County. Uh, I think maybe you all were together at a elementary school? At Mid South Creek. At a, okay. And they're going to tell us about, I think, what you found when you arrived and what you did with it. First of all, um, there's a, if you'll just take a look at the slide, um, we want you to kind of think of a principal that you had as a student. We want you to keep in mind this person as we go through our presentation. So if you'll just look at those few thoughts to consider um, and just keep that in mind as we go through. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as Representative Blackwell said, um, I'm Larry Hodges. I was an assistant principal <laughs> under Ms. Wagner. Uh, we worked together for three years, and I'm now an assistant principal at the other middle school in the district. We uh, need you okay. to do that so that the yep, audio will pick up for recording. No problem. Um, so just to kind of capitalize on a little bit of what Dr. Mazinga said, I actually meant mentoring is, is critically important, and, and I feel great to be able to come here and, and present this actually with with one of my mentors right here with me, with Ms. Wagner. Um, so really, uh, leadership is is the key here. We need, as Winston Churchill said, we need people who can lead from the front rather than command or manage from the rear. And I want to make a distinction, too, between the difference between training and preparation. Training is something to deal with specific tasks and specific situations that are repeatable and likely to come up again Whereas a preparation program um, is something that puts you in place to be able to be successful in challenging and different circumstances. And, and I went through a really great leadership preparation program at, at the Northeast Leadership Academy or, or deal at NC State. Um, and just sort of a, a, a distinction here too between an adaptive challenge um, adaptive challenges require building uh, teams in order to solve them. They require continuous improvement, um, and there's usually no clear path to solve them. As, as lawmakers, most of what you guys deal with are adaptive challenges, uh, whether it's trying to put in a, a health care system that's going to be uh, work for everybody. You have different opinions. Uh, there's no one model that's going to fit. Each, each site it is going to be a different case actually so each school for us when we go in and try to and try to create a transformative school each community community is going to be different the teachers are going to be different um, versus a technical challenge which might be very difficult in and of itself but there's a clear pathway to success there so honestly something like landing an airplane on an aircraft carrier incredibly difficult only a few people are qualified to do it but that's a technical challenge you get the right people with the right skill set and give them the right amount of training uh, they can replicate that. It's been done before, but adaptive challenges are what we're facing here, and you need leaders in order to meet those adaptive challenges. Um, so some of the components of effective preparation programs, um, like the ones that I've been able to go through, uh, performance-based candidate assessments are really important. I went through an entire day, actually, of simulations, a lot of different interviews, putting me in different scenarios to see how I would react. Uh, what kind of prior leadership experience that I have. I had recommendations from current principals in my district and the superintendent. Uh, those are all really important. And also the concept of a residency model and being with a great mentor principal, but then also having that uh, backup of being at a research university and learning what are the research proven uh, factors that are going to be significant in going into, uh, and I like to use the word transforming a school actually. A turnaround is really important, but that's just the first step. Um, and it's, it's sustainability and systemic change uh, more than just kind of a, of a quick fix. Um, and then I guess the last one I want to say is just really looking at things from an asset model. There are a lot of things that, that are wrong in our schools and in our communities. And if I wanted to go in and, and focus on everything that we didn't have, I would get really discouraged really fast actually and, and leave me nothing to build on. Uh, but going in and being able to do a needs assessment and an asset model, what do we have in place here, what can we build on, 
that's that's the way to, to bring about successful change. All right, um, looking at supervising our school leaders, um, I am a MSA graduate of uh, East Carolina University. I was a principal fellow, and um, I have, in my past eight years as a principal, I have had eight principal interns. My last three, I currently um, have an intern, but my last three have been NELA interns. They have been residency um, interns, which means they've spent a year with me um, in the trenches and that has been the most important part we we learn skills in isolation and as a principal you can learn about cultural leadership strategic leadership instructional leadership but on a day-to-day -day basis you are using those skills all at once and you cannot get the training for those skills if you are not using them in a life um, basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the things that I have gotten from um, the NILA interns is that they have not only gotten great training being in the school, but they have also been able to bring things to our schools. So that has been also positive. Um, Looking at effective principles, I would say that there are three things that are main focus. And that would be to focus on best practices, to make sure that you are working with a sense of urgency. And that may sound a little um, unusual, but I look at the fact that I have two daughters who are in their early 20s, and I still, every day or every opportunity, I'm trying to teach them and mold them and shape them. I look at my middle school students who I have for three years and every day, every minute has to count for those students. I know that every single child has to get the best education that they can get every minute of every day. And that's a very important part for um, to be an effective principal. The other thing, and as uh, Dr. Mavengo discussed, is using that data. And you have to know how to, to dissect that data and make sure that you're using it and using it in the best way possible. I think the, the other thing is you've got to combine those things with a positive culture. Um, we have had a very low turnaround in our school as far as teacher turnover, but it's because of the culture that we've been able to create, the support we've been able to give for our teachers, and the fact that our teachers come every day wanting to give the best to every student. Not only do we have a low turnover, but I have 10 out of my 30 staff members come from out of county. I have one teacher who drives 60 miles each way just to come to work. And I think a lot of that too honestly speaks to the, that the role of the principal has changed actually, uh, especially at, at a turnaround school. Because the stakes are so high, um, you know, students, we need to get them to proficiency and beyond to be able to participate in, in, the, in our economy and keep our state and our nation competitive um, with, with the world around us. All right, so just um, a couple of the ways that we've, um, that, we've, that, we've, that we've been able to accomplish this. We've, we've put in place effective pr procedures, uh, SOP, standing operator procedures, is something that a lot of us are familiar with. If you had either military or, or business background, and that really just sets the expectations for everybody, every teacher, every student, in, in every situation. Relationships, really the heart of, of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build an effective team. Uh, both of us, actually, we speak to every student every day by name. Uh, a lot of times, actually, that occurs by the time the Pledge of Allegiance has been said. And again, that's just, just an example of, of leading from the front rather than being back in our office and waiting for problems to come to us. We have to get out and know our students and, and know our teachers and be absolutely aware of everything that's going on every day, uh, socially, emotionally, in our, in our buildings. Um, the instructional focus, you know, that's the core mission of what we're about. Uh, so understanding, um, you know, are we meeting those needs? And that's, you know, Dr. Mabinga talked about data. Uh, that's something that we definitely keep up um, in track with. And it's, it's the student learning 
that's ultimately what matters. That's the bottom line. We can have all these great programs and do great things in our school, but it's not leading to student learning. It's really not important. Um, so last, I want to get to this slide too. So what does this look like in our outcomes? And so those folders actually are the last four years of cumulative discipline data at South Creek Middle School. Um, and what that really has allowed us to do is clear the space for that instructional leadership and be able to move the climate and the culture of our school forward. Kids are spending more time in school, more time in class, and it, it just makes sense that they're going to do better and that they're going to progress. Um, so also student achievement growth. Uh, right up the road here, the SAS Corporation puts out a statistical software package called EVOS. Um, they look at the historical testing profile of each student and can actually generate a probability of success at proficiency for any student on any given test. So, um, you know, if I was a seventh grade student, I might have a, and it's down to the tenth, it might be a 79.5% chance of proficiency, and it ranges from 99.9 .9 down to 0, 0 0.1. Um, and they, at the end of the year, that all gets uh, put through their algorithm, and the school is assigned a composite growth rating. Anything above two is considered to be outstanding and exceeding growth. At our school, we've been above five for three years running. I've got a little video here actually. Leadership sets clear direction and goals for our staff and our students. My experience in South Korea has one. Our administration allows us to teach using. While we're doing that, one, one piece of data I've got here actually, so a couple years ago I went and looked at the EVOS composite scores for every school in the state of North Carolina. There's more than 2,100 of them. This is a really long scroll. It's about 30 or 40 feet long. Um, our school actually is right, it's the bold one, right about where my right hand is, right here. Um, if I unrolled this, actually we could go front to back in this room several times. So that, that's just a comparison. Right? And we share this with the students actually and it's now become part of our culture. Hey, we want to get to the top of the list. Can we, can we, can we get up a little bit higher even? Um, so what we do is we asked some of the staff members and the students actually to, to talk about what they what they felt about our school and what were some of the reasons for, for that success. So I've just um, got about a minute and a half, a uh, couple little clips here from some of them. Yeah, okay. Um, really, I guess from a, from a pure data standpoint, the very first year we were at about 30% of our students were, were proficient on a grade level. And over the last three years, we've had a pretty steady increase to last year was just about 50% or, or just a little bit over. Um, but we also really see ourselves in that transformational mindset and um, really drive, having those discussions with, with our community members and our teachers and everybody to, to continue to drive that forward. And I think part of the, the mindset, honestly, too, of an adaptive challenge is that you're always seeking continuous improvement. There is no one uh, best model, or I don't ever anticipate getting to the point where, you know what, this is good enough, and it's, it's as good as I can possibly be, and, and the work is done uh, each, each and every day. Uh, we, even at the end of the day, honestly, a lot of times we sit down and have conversations about, okay, what can, what can we do to improve, what went well, um, and, and then it's also a team approach as well. I think um, the other thing, if you, if you would take a look on the back sheet um, of our handout, um, and you will see a list of our eighth grade, um, as Mr. Hodgkins was talking about, the EVOS predictor scores. And we use those scores to make sure that we are addressing individual needs of each child as well as group needs. Um, but if you'll look, they range, uh, there are about eight students who have a more than 40% chance of making a level three or higher on the eighth grade um, end of grade math test. And one of the things that we have been able to do is we have been able to surpass those predictor scores. If you'll turn to the back of that sheet, um, Mr. Hodgkins actually made a chart in basketball terms that 
might make it a little bit easier for some of us to understand. Yeah, and, and so even if, if you're a Duke or a, or a North Carolina or a SOAR state fan, hopefully you, you can uh, relate to that. Um, and, and really the interpretation of that is, is, is any student really who had at least a 15% chance of, of proficiency, we historically have been very successful with them. So really what I did was just broke the students down in terms of, of some categories and looked at how we did um, which each, with each of those on each grade levels. And so you know, it, it provides some real data for us in terms of which grade levels and which teachers are really doing great things um, with, with some more of our difficult students. experience at South Creek has been wonderful. Our administration allows us to teach using innovation uh, that we come up with. If we fail, then we're not judged by that. We are encouraged to reflect and improve the practice. I'm the custodian uh, here at South Creek Middle School, and uh, I, I just enjoy the school, uh, enjoy the people, the, the staff, and the children. Uh, but one thing that I'm so positive is it seems like everybody here is just ready and empowered and determined to just give a hand with everything. Our students are encouraged to buy into the culture of the school, which is a positive environment that moves every student forward. Um, the way it teaches us um, at the end of the day during flakes. And I just love the school. I create good movies. They really make you feel welcome in the school. I was a new student last year, and they really brought me in, and I felt very safe. The staff and the principals help us with student achievements because they push us to try harder to reach our achievements. One of the main reasons why I'm saying is because um, the administration. I really enjoy the administration and the support we have here and the staff here. We all are like <coughs> So just, just like we put together, I guess, a little uh, wish list, for, for lack of a better word, in terms of maybe some things that we'd like to see. Uh, the one, and I, and I know the state's working on this, is what we term maybe an equitable accountability measure. So again, as Dr. Mabega said, principal turnover is, is an issue. Um, and we can speak to this firsthand from working in some really challenging schools. When, when we're graded, um, on mostly for student proficiency. So all these gains that we've made, our, our school actually is, was a low C this past year. And if, if we had gone to a 10 point grading scale, we would have been an F. And, and that hurts morale both for the principals and the teachers and, and the students. Um, now obviously, you know, getting to 80% and 90% proficiency is, is certainly our goal. Uh, but when principals, um, leave and you have principal turnovers, a lot of them actually leave the profession, not just going to another school in another district. And in order really to have the biggest return on an investment in our preparation programs, uh, we want to be able to uh, recognize, you know, not necessarily through pay even, but just through an, an accountability measure and just say, hey, you know, we recognize that you're making progress and, and going in the right direction. And if you notice even from Dr. Mabinga's slides, it took two or three years uh, for them to get up to the point where they got that school of distinction. So just making that progress and, and being recognized for that is, uh, is, is something that's important. Uh, just going back to our first slide, if you would, would you just raise your hand if you think or you know that your principal knew your name? And um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share. I graduated from a high school of 1,200 students. I actually um, I was very active in my school. I was a the student government secretary. I had uh, many leads in the school performances, and um, I don't ever remember having a conversation with my principal. I actually had to go to my yearbook last night to look up his name, and um, I told Larry there was a lovely blurb in the yearbook. 
regarding what a wonderful man he was and what wonderful things he did. But um, I hope that my children that come through my school will uh, know a little bit about me more than just the wonderful things I did, but how I cared for them and how I cared for the fact that I wanted them to be successful in any way that they wanted to be successful. Thank you.